The greatest financial experiment is about to end really badly, and it's, it's ending right now. Now, it was Sunday night, exactly 50 years ago, that the greatest financial experiment in the history of the world started. That night, over 5,000 years of money as we knew it were gone, and the entire world changed. As with most experiments, no one was sure or certain how things would play out, but today, with 50 years of testing, in hindsight, we can see just how disastrous this experiment has been. Now, in this video, I'm gonna cover what exactly happened 50 years ago, what has happened during this experiment. We're gonna take a look at the actual data, the facts, the numbers, and of course, most importantly, using history of this change and the experiment as our guide and our lens, we're gonna look at what's happening right now that tells us what exactly comes next and how understanding this shift today is the key for you surviving and thriving as the world's greatest financial experiment comes to an end and the next one starts so let's go all right we're going to jump right into it we're going to talk about the experiment the financial experiment and what the results have been and how it's coming to an end. Now, real quickly, um, if you don't make it to the end, I wanna let you know that I am gonna do a live presentation of this where I'm gonna break down part of what we're talking about here, but really all the implications of what's happening right now, how it's all coming apart right now, and more specifically, what is the next system that we're expecting to move into. So there's a live presentation. There's a link in the description down below if you'd like to come attend. It's, it's gonna be long, which is why I can't cover it on a YouTube video, but click on that link down below in the description if you wanna to come to that live event, it's gonna be massive. It's gonna tell you what comes next after this. But back to where we're at 50 years ago. Now at the time of this recording, the actual anniversary was one day ago yesterday. Um, and basically 50 years ago to the day it ended, as I said earlier, 5,000 years of history. So for what is that? For the monetary system, gold was money for 5,000 years, gold. Gold was money. And basically, 50 years ago um, to the day, uh, yesterday, this guy right here, he severed all ties to gold and put us into a financial monetary experiment. Now, that may sound a little bit weird, but wait till I break this down. Now, the dollar was used as a reserve currency for 27 years. Um, now, just to go back to history, typically I like to go way back into history, but I'll be real quick here. So um, the dollar took over the reserve status from the pound, from the British pound. Um, in 1944, the Bretton Woods Agreement got together. The world leaders all got together and agreed that there would be a new financial system, 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement, a new financial system where the dollar would be pegged to gold, $35 equaled one ounce of gold, and then all the other currencies of the world were pegged to the dollar. So thereby the entire world was on a gold standard. Now that lasted only 27 years before that got severed, all right, 27 years. <clears throat> and it's been about 50 years since of fiat money, right? That's when the experiment ended. We severed ties to gold, which was money for 5,000 years. And so for 50 years now, we've been in what's known as fiat currency, which means money by decree, means the government says it has value, so it does. And that is just a small little blip in history. 50 years is nothing in the grand scheme of things. Now, uh, I want to talk specifically about what pre uh, President, then President uh, Richard Nixon said in his speech. Um, and so before we dive into what he actually said, let's go right to the video. The strength of a nation's currency is based on the strength of that nation's economy. And the American economy is by far the strongest in the world. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. All right, so you heard it right from him first. Now, a couple things I wanna pull out. So first off, he said that the strongest currency equals the strongest economy, which, yeah, I would, uh, I would say that. Now, I might say, what is the strongest? <laughs> what does it mean by the strongest? Well, I would say sound money would be the strongest, but strongest currency, strongest economy. Um, he said at the time, 1971, America is the strongest economy. Now, is it the strongest economy anymore? We're gonna look at some data about that. He said that the dollar is the monetary pillar all the way around the world, which because since 1944, the entire world was pegged to the dollar. So of course it was that. He said that they needed to do this. They needed to sever the ties specifically for this. 
defend the dollar against speculators. Now, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that since 1944, the dollar was supposed to be $35 convertible, $35 for one ounce of gold. But everybody knew that the United States was creating more dollars than they had gold. And so what happened is the speculators, these evil speculators were saying, hey, we don't believe you have the dollars or the gold to back this up. We don't believe this peg is valid. We want the gold. We don't want the dollars, we want the gold. And then what happens because people try to protect the peg is speculators come in and start betting against that peg. Uh, go watch this uh, George Soros video I did right here where I talked about how he made a billion dollars in a day breaking the peg of the Bank of England. Um, and so speculators were doing that and so they had to defend the dollar. Well, if they had just stuck to the agreement, which was to only have enough gold and dollars to uh, back each other, they would have never had to defend anything. The speculators saw an opportunity because they knew the government was lying. Anyway, there's that. Um, and so he said that they were going to temporarily, I put that into quotes, temporarily suspend convertibility of the dollar. Of course, uh, it was uh, Milton Friedman who said that there's no such thing as a temporary government measure. And so temporarily suspended, of course, there's no way it's ever going back at this point. Um, and then Treasury Secretary John Connolly said at the end, said, I will be perfectly frank with you. None of us know for certain what will occur. We're going into this financial experiment. Gold has been money, sound money for 5,000 years. We're going into this age of free floating currencies and none of us know for certain what will occur. All right, now there's a couple key pieces that I wanna dig into here, all right? Um, he said that the time has come for a new economic policy for the United States. Of course, it changed everything. Um, its targets are unemployment, inflation, and international speculation. So. Um, this is what he was supposedly going to fix. Of course, is unemployment better today or is it high? Is inflation fixed or is it high? And of course, do we still have lots of international speculation? Those are the key pieces that we want to dig into here. Now, um, let's take a look at 1971 or let's go to 1970, the year before, and compare that to now. Now, the first thing I want to bring into uh, in, in, bring up is that wealth is not money. All right. So a lot of people think that the government just create more wealth. They just print, print more money, send money to everybody. Money, currency is not wealth. Wealth equals goods and services. I use this analogy a lot. If you watch my channel, if we are stuck on a deserted island with no boat, no way to get off, no food, no water, no cell phone to call for help, but we had a billion dollars in a suitcase, would we be wealthy? Well, there's nothing to spend it. There's no goods and services to buy and that would be worth nothing. Now, what if there was one guy that was there that had a hut with some shade and some coconuts? Well, he would be wealthy. We would have a billion dollars. We would not be wealthy. We would need to buy the goods and services, all right? And so you have to understand it. So for a nation to be wealthy, the nation must produce goods and services, right? So let's take a look at that. So the deficits of 1971 versus 2021. So the federal deficit in 1971 peaked at 2% of GDP. Today in 2021, we're at about 14 to 15%, 15% last year. So we went from 2% debt to GDP, uh, to deficit, meaning how short the government spending is, meaning the government's spending more money than they're bringing in. It was 2% of GDP, now it's about 14, 15%. Now this is not including the $1.2 trillion of infrastructure that's going through or the 3.5 trillion that they're already talking about adding on. Of course, once those go through, we'll see this go way higher. The other thing is the trade deficit. So remember, wealth is goods and services. So if we're selling goods and services, we're creating, we're producing, and then we're selling, that's good. Well, we're not doing that anymore. Now we're importing all the goods and services. Of course, you know this, right? The United States, the, the, the middle class has been hollowed out. All the manufacturing has gone offshore. Um, 1971, it was barely even registered on the GDP. Today, it's three and a half percent of GDP. So look how much that has gone up. You can see it on a little chart right here just to get a little bit, a little bit better. Uh, visual on it. Um, and so you can see right here, 1971, and it was basically just sitting on this line. And of course, uh, we've dipped down around 2008 and we're heading back down again. This gives you a little bit better representation of that. But to really get an idea, let's look at some charts. Charts are data. They say what a picture is worth a thousand words. And so let's look at some actual pictures and some charts. So since 1971, this is the growth in productivity and the wage gap. So we can see that right here in 1971, 
the wages have remained stagnant while productivity has gone up. Well, as productivity went up, shouldn't wages, of course, but they didn't. Now let's keep looking at more and more things. This is GDP versus earnings. So again, right here, 1971, we can see that earnings, wages, what you're getting paid has stayed flat while GDP has gone up. Now we can see this, this is income growth. So we can see that income was growing, growing, growing. People were making more money. Everybody was becoming more wealthy. People were buying houses and cars and everybody was feeling great about themselves. And then zoom, just flatlined right at 1971. We can see, we could just keep going on. I have a couple good ones here. This is um, good trade balance. So remember, we want to be producing goods and services. That's wealth. We want to be exporting those. So we want to have trade. You know, we export what we're good at, we import what we're not good at, but we can see that the balance, 1971 right here, has just fallen off of a cliff. And of course, all those things, when you um, offshore all the jobs, you get rid of all the jobs, guess what happens? Well, the income share, the wealth inequality gap grows. So right here, 1971, we can see the rise of income inequality. Um, this was right around 19, uh, this is the, around the Great Depression right here, so it was kind of a little bit higher. Things were pretty good, and then since 1971, it's absolutely exploded. Now, it's no reason, or it's no wonder, that uh, the wealth inequality gap has gone up, because if we look at 1971 right here, this is household essentials. So this is your electricity, your food, your fruit, and you can see how far it's gone up. Now, these are essential. So when you make a billion dollars, you know, the amount of food doesn't change. Like a poor person and a rich person eat about the same amount of food. Sure, the quality of their food might be a little bit different, but the amount of food they consume is the same, but the percentage of their overall budget is different. And we can see how much those have sped up. Now, those are numbers, those are metric, but what does that do to a society? That's pretty interesting. So look at this. So this is 1971 right here. This is the incarceration rate. So for some reason, the incarceration rate just was managing to stay pretty flat. Now, of course, this was, we had prohibition where um, alcohol was illegal. Uh, we had lots of gangs and things like that, um, but it all stayed pretty flat. And then 1971, shh, you can see they just completely went off the charts. So that's what happens to the society when the money falls apart. Here's a couple more charts we can look at. This right here is the divorce rate. They were all kind of tied together. 1971 absolutely exploded. Now, why would having a bad money cause the divorce rate to increase? Well, there's a bunch of reasons, but maybe the number one reason is because what are most divorces about? Well, people fight over money. When it becomes very difficult to live, when you can't afford your bills, it puts a lot of stress, it causes a lot of arguments, a lot of fights. Now two people have to go out into the workplace at once. Um, they're not growing together, they're growing apart. And we can see that with data. We can also see the percentage of children born to unwed mothers, again, had stayed pretty flat. 1971 happened and you can see they go off the chart. We can also see the trends in obesity. So obesity was staying pretty flat. 1971 comes into place and people start getting fat. <laughs> they become obese all because of the money. That's why when we talk about fix the money, fix the world, you can see this in some charts. What about this? Healthcare expenditure. So again, healthcare had remained pretty flat and all of a sudden 1971 healthcare expenses went up off the chart. Now, why? Well, there's a bunch of reasons why, but one of them is also this chart right here, which is the growth of physicians and administrators. So the physicians are this chart right here, which has been growing, but the administrators, look how the administrators have completely blown up under this fake fiat monetary system. I got two more that we'll look at real quick and then we'll wrap this part up. Um, this is the CPI, this is the consumer price index. This is the basket of goods that measures how much it costs for you to live. And you can see that the cost of living had remained pretty much flat. This is 1775 all the way through um, to 1971 right here. And look at that, the cost of living has gone so high. And then the last chart we're gonna look at, this is an important one. So this is the amount of debt, federal debt, total public debt. Here we have about 1950 or 60, you can see it remained pretty flat, 1971. And now we can look at the amount of debt. This is over the last uh, year right here. And so that's in 50 years. Under this monetary experiment, in just 50 years, everything has fallen apart.
You can see for a hundred years before, in many cases, that things had remained pretty steady. And within 50 years, we've gone to 0% interest rates, uh, hundreds of trillions of dollars of debt, all of society fabric is breaking down. That's the result of the monetary experiment. All right, now, um, when we severed gold, obviously you can see it changed everything. Because when we were tied to gold, it limited the government on how much they were able to print. Now, um, something, uh, a side note about this is that everything is about limiting the government. The problem is that the government is run by people, it's run by man, man is flawed, um, and, 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 and the type of people that are attracted to politics are typically not the best type of people. And so they're always gonna try to game the system, they're always gonna try to be selfish and look out for themselves. And so the law, the reason why we need gold was to restrain the government. It would keep them from printing more money than they had gold. Same with the Constitution. Uh, a lot of people you'll see in the news and the headlines today, they're saying that the Constitution gives us freedoms, gives us liberties. The Constitution doesn't allow this freedom. That's completely wrong. The Constitution limits the governments. All our freedoms are guaranteed. They're given to us by our Creator. The Constitution limits the government, just like gold was supposed to do that. But when we severed the ties back in 1970, we ended commodity money. So gold is a commodity, gold and silver being a commodity. And because they're limited, because they're real, because they're tangible, it limited how much money could be created, it created and so it moved to that fiat money, which uh, like I said, instead of the market determining that there was value there, and so money's changed a lot of times. We had feathers and we had shells. Whatever the market deemed valuable could be used as money, but now fiat says, it's not what the market says, it's by decree because the government says it has value, it does. And now it's all based on information. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about where we're going next. All right, now, first, before we do that, we have to understand that the reserve currency, the dollar, is dying. It's not just dying on its own. It's actually being killed because of poor management. All right, no different than from the beginning of time. So 1913, the Federal Reserve was created, the central bank, um, and the IRS was created at the same time, and they started printing too much money right off the bat, 1913. By 1933, they had created so many additional dollars that they had to f shut all the banking down and then seize everybody's gold. They needed more gold. Then they had to revalue it from about, from about $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce, stealing all the wealth from everybody because they had poor management. So they kind of fixed it in 1933, revalued at $35. By 1944, they went into the Bretton Woods Agreement, still at $35. But as I said earlier, in 27 years, they couldn't protect the peg. Again, because it was poorly managed. All right, now, technology like we see today expose the fundamental inefficiencies of what we have. And so there's something called creative destruction. That means when something new is created, something, a new way to solve problems, it destroys the old way. That's what technology does. And technology comes, it's so much better, it's so much more efficient that it destroys the old way. And what we're gonna see in the future is technology will move money away from nations, away from central banks, away from governments, and instead we'll see more like private innovative currencies. Now the system's already changing and it's changing fast. Of course, unless you've been asleep like Rip Van Winkle forever, you know that the rise of cryptocurrencies are here. Whatever you think about them doesn't change the fact that they are here, but I want you to be aware of something something known as the patsy. Do you know what the patsy is? That means when somebody is set up to take the fall, right? So um, a lot of times that's been done. I'm not gonna get into conspiracies about that, but the patsy. And so we're starting to see maybe cryptocurrencies might be set up to take the fall, could be the patsy. And so what we're seeing is regulators are starting to come in. I've done a couple videos on this infrastructure bill and how they wanna start to regulate cryptocurrencies even more. We have the new head of the SEC, Gary Gensler, who was supposed to be pro crypto. He was teaching about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies at MIT. He knows it very well. He's come in and he's asking for increased scrutiny. He says that um, he needs more power in order to do his job. Now we can see here, he says crypto investors are not adequately protected. Now, the thing that gets me about that right there, he says crypto investors are not adequately protected. So I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I can't protect myself. I need the big government to come in and protect me and tell me what I'm allowed to do because I'm not smart enough to decide that for myself. We're not adequately protected. We're not protected from putting our money into things. Now, they don't protect us from putting our money into lotteries or putting it all on, in Vegas, 
but supposedly in the cryptocurrency space, we're not adequately protected, so he wants to change that. The priority should be center on crypto trading, lending, and DeFi, decentralized finance platforms. Attach guardrails to crypto trading and lending. So that's really where they're coming after. Lending, now of course, why would they do that? Well, if you put your money in the bank, you earn no interest. If you take your money out and put it into cryptocurrencies and operate in some of these DeFi crypto lending spaces, you could earn six, eight, 10% on your money. So guess what? A lot of people wanna do that. Why would I make zero when I can go make six, eight, 10%? So a lot of people are. They don't like that. They want to focus on that specifically. And then of course we have Senator Elizabeth Warren here. She says that um, it puts the hands in the, in the, of the shadowy super coders. That's what she said. And she said they will wreck the financial system. So they're setting cryptocurrencies up to be the patsy, to be the fall guy. The financial system's already fallen apart. It's been falling apart for 50 years. I showed you the data. It doesn't have much further to go. The whole thing is cracking apart on its own. Left on its own, it crumbles. But they're already setting up the cryptocurrencies to be the fall guy, to be the patsy of that. So watch out for that. Now, I want you to understand that what we really need is innovation and not regulation, right? We need innovation. We're living through a monetary revolution right now. Like I said, 5,000 years of monetary history was severed and we're 50 years into this experiment. That's failed drastically. It's failed big time. I showed you all the charts, not only just on the money side, making it harder for us to live, but destroying the family unit, putting people in prison and so much more. We're living through a new monetary revolution. It's changing as we speak. History books will be written about this period in time. Now, this the change that we're seeing is as profound as leaving the gold. Now, like I said, 5,000 years of history was severed. That was a big, big change. And what we're going through right now is just as profound. But there's a little bit of a difference, all right? In the 70s and the 80s, attempts to regulate failed. The government wasn't as big. It wasn't as powerful. Not near as big. Not near as powerful. It didn't have all that fake money to fight with. And so it failed at attempts to, um, to regulate. Now, even in the internet days, we've talked about this in other videos, where the internet almost died. And if it wasn't for the government actually passing laws to allow the innovation to happen, it probably would have been dead. All right. And actually, under Reagan, there was massive deregulation. Uh, Reagan really tried to decrease the size of the government. There was massive deregulation that enabled American financial institutions to become the dominant players in international markets. Now, in hindsight, our banks are probably too big and have too much power, but it was really the deregulation that allowed them to grow, allowed them to prosper, allowed new technology, allowed new businesses to grow and prosper. All right, but the cycles of history, you know, I talk about cycles because it continues to repeat over and over. We can see today that the financial institutions we have now, they're fat, they're old, they're lethargic, they're outdated. Every time I have to get in my car, drive to the bank, stand in line, fill out the form for a wire transfer, pay 35 bucks, drive back to my house, it takes an hour out of my day, and then it takes a day for the wire transfer to get there, I just leave thinking, the banks are dead. That's a dead man walking. The technology is so old and they don't want to change. They're fat, old, lethargic. They're dead, right? Using what they do is they use regulation barriers, though, to fend off the competition. So uh, using the new infrastructure bill, using Gary Gensler, the SEC, Elizabeth Warren, they can put laws and regulations into place to prevent innovation from coming out and, and innovating them out. Rather than and rather than not being old and lethargic, rather than getting on the innovation bandwagon, they'd rather just pass laws to stifle that innovation. Uh, the other thing is that the U.S. is trying to compete on central bank digital currencies, and I believe that leads to failure because that's central planning, right? So China is coming out with their digital yuan. I've made videos talking about how the United States is coming out with their Fed coin, trying to compete on a central bank digital currency, but that is centralized answer. Centralization always fails. America has been great because America has been where the innovation is. China has been stealing the innovation from the United States for decades because they can't out-innovate. And the innovation is done by the free markets. And I believe the best way to win a race with totalitarian rivals is not to try to copy them, not try to make another digital currency like China has, but rather out 
innovate them. And that's exactly what technology is doing right now today with cryptocurrencies. It is out innovating the world if the private markets could just be left alone to do that. Now, this is part one of this series we're going to talk about on the next video. I'm going to talk about problems that we're starting to see all through society based off of this. And then, of course, the live event I'm doing next week where I'm going to talk about um, the transition, what that means, how we set ourselves up to survive that. There's a link in the description down below if you'd like to come hang out where I can go through all this data with you. All right, now leave a comment and let me know what you think. Do you think it's better to out innovate the centralized central bank digital currencies or should we, uh, you know, if we can't beat them, join them and we should try to out compete them on a centralized answer. Leave me a comment and let me know what you think down below. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. And if you don't like the video, give me a thumbs down. That's okay. But leave me a comment at least and tell me why. That's what I got for you today. To your success, I'm out.